Hello and welcome to Bio Lessons to Go. I'm Mr. Dove, and this is Independent Assortment and the Two Factor Cross. Gregor Mendel, the Austrian monk who is considered to be the father of modern genetics, discovered many things about the characteristics of pea plants and their various traits. Some of the things that Mendel discovered included was that yellow was dominant over green in pea plants and that the round shape was dominant over wrinkled. When observing the characteristics inherited one at a time, these characteristics showed very predictable inheritance patterns. For example, when a hybrid round was crossed with a hybrid round, Mendel always seemed to get about three quarters round and one quarter wrinkled. While uh, with yellow, hybrid yellow crossed with hybrid yellow, once again you would get approximately three quarters yellow and one quarter green. Mendel wondered what patterns he might see if he looked at the two traits being inherited at the exact same time. To observe the patterns of two traits inherited at the same time, Mendel set up an experiment. First, he needed some purebred varieties. Using a self-pollination technique, Mendel created his purebred pea generation. We had purebred yellow and round, and purebred green and wrinkled. Purebred, they only have uh, yellow and round genes, or only green and wrinkled genes. He allowed these to cross-pollinate to create hybrids. When parents pass on their traits to their offspring, they give exactly one half of their genetic makeup. So one half of our round and yellow is going to be one round allele and one yellow allele. Uh, one half of a green and wrinkled is going to be a green allele and a wrinkled allele. In the F1, the first filial generation, the first set of offspring, every single one of the offspring are round and yellow, which makes sense because of Mendel's principle of dominance. The yellow and the round trait is going to dominate and mask the green and wrinkled. Now, what pattern might emerge if we allowed for these round and yellows to uh, self-fertilize? So we have our F2 generation. And something interesting occurred. We had nine that were yellow and round, but then we had three that were green and round, a variety we had not yet seen before. We had three that were yellow and wrinkled, yet another variety that we had never seen before. And then one, it was our totally recessive green and wrinkled. So we have these brand new varieties, these new combinations that seems to have arisen. So what might explain this? To explain these results, Mendel proposed the principle of independent assortment, which in modern day language is that when we're forming gametes, sperm and egg, during meiosis, the alleles, those inheritable factors that Mendel proposed, sort independently of one another. In other words, seed color is not going to influence seed shape. So our F1 hybrids, for example, um, which contain both round and wrinkled alleles, as well as yellow and green alleles, when they pass on half um, during meiosis to their offspring, we could have the round allele going with the yellow allele, the round allele going with the green allele, the wrinkled allele going with the yellow allele or wrinkled going with green. So seed color is not influencing seed shape in the same way that eye color is not necessarily um, going to have to go with um, person's height. A Punnett square shows how this outcome can occur. As a result of independent assortment, um, we get unique gamete combinations from the F1 hybrids. When they combine, we get four 
different phenotypes that can arise. Nine out of three are going to be our rounds and yellows. Then we have three out of 16, which are going to be uh, wrinkled and yellow. We've got three out of 16, which are green and, uh, green and round. And then one out of 16, which is green and wrinkled. So those unique gametes will then combine to create those varieties that we saw in Mendel's experiment. Now meiosis supports this principle because when the chromosomes, which are carrying those genes, those inheritable factors, show up on the equatorial plane, because they're aligning independently of each other, we can get very unique combinations in the offspring. So for example, um, we can get, um, in this case, a combination where uh, we're passing on brown eyes and black hair, or blue eyes and red hair. Or we could get brown eyes and red hair, and blue eyes with black hair. Just depends on how those alleles align up during metaphase and then separate during anaphase. So how would we go about producing a Punnett square when we're looking at um, two traits at the same time? We call these Punnett squares a dihybrid cross because we're crossing two traits at the same time. Now there are three good steps um, that we should utilize when we're building a Punnett square. This is actually uh, three steps that can be used in any Punnett square, even our simple monohybrid or single factor crosses. The first step of building any Punnett square is what are the parents' genes? What genes can they pass down to their offspring? Our second step is what are going to be the parents' unique gametes? During meiosis, what are going to be all the different combinations of uh, genes that they can pass down to their offspring? And then once we determine that, and only then can we set up our Punnett square. So let's try a little practice together. So let's practice together setting up a Punnett square when we're looking at two traits at the same time. For our example, uh, we're looking at the some guinea pigs. In guinea pigs, black is dominant to brown hair and short hair is dominant to long. So these are the characteristics that we're going to look at. In this question, we are crossing two heterozygous black and short guinea pigs. So step one of our Punnett square is what are the genes of our parents? What's the genotypes of our parents? Well, they tell us that both parents are heterozygous for black and heterozygous for short. So take a minute and think. You might want to pause um, the recording and see if you can determine what would be the genotype of these guinea pigs. To be heterozygous for black, you'll need one dominant and one recessive allele. To be heterozygous for short, you'll need one dominant for short hair and one recessive long hair gene. So you're heterozygous for both traits. We have the alleles, the each other allele, the dominant and the recessive. We're heterozygous for both traits. And since both parents have the same genotype, which gives them the same phenotype, that's going to be the um, genotype of the other parent. So our next question uh, to set up a Punnett square is what is going to be the unique gametes that form during meiosis? So this is our step two. Um, what are the gametes? Parents pass on half of their traits to their offspring. And so we want to figure out what are all of the possible combinations that these parents could potentially pass on to their offspring. Well, heterozygous individuals, in the case of you know black and short, the black gene can go with the short gene. The black gene can go with the long. The brown can go with short. And the brown can go with long. That's that principle of independent assortment. And since both parents are identical in their genotype, they're going to have the same um, essential um, combination of alleles that they're going to pass down to their offspring. Now, 
how can we come up with this in an easy way? Is there any way to make sure that we're not making a mistake and that we're getting all of the possible combinations? Well, there is. I call this the smile format um, because in the end, we're going to kind of be building a little smiley face. Um, but as we look at this, you'll notice that it sort of remembers um, the process of FOIL in um, your math class. So we start with our first two um, alleles. That's going to be a combination. So big B can go with the big S. That gives us our first eyeball. Then we take the last letters, the little b with the little s. That gives us our second eyeball. Then we take the middle letters. That's going to give us our nose, little b and big S. And then uh, the first and the last. And that finishes our smiley face. You can kind of see that there. A little smiley face. And that allows for us then to make sure that we've got all the combinations, every single combination of alleles. That then allows us to go to our step three where we set up our Punnett square. The alleles for one parent goes on one side and the alleles for the other parent goes on the other side. So this could be the male's sperm that are going to be passed down and uh, carrying those alleles. And then these could, uh, over here, these could be the eggs that then could potentially be fertilized by those sperm. The cool thing is this works just like any regular Punnett square. We take the alleles from one parent and we combine them with the alleles with the other in that little square, in that little box. So big B, big B, big S, big S. So big B, big B big S, little s, and so on until you have the entire Punnett square filled out. So you want to continue filling out the Punnett square um, with me. You might want to pause to make sure that you can fill it out yourself um, and then uh, restart when you have it filled out so you can check yourself. Now, once you have your Punnett square filled out, the last thing that we do is we analyze that Punnett square. We determine things like the genotype ratio and the phenotype ratio. The problem is there are so many different genotype combinations here, it would be very difficult for us to have a, a, a reasonable genotype ratio. So in two-factor or dihybrid crosses, the only thing that we consider is the phenotype ratio. So we have to interpret each square and figure out what are the physical characteristics of the offspring. So in our first box, because we only have black genes and short genes, our individual is going to be black and short. In the next box, we have black genes and short and long genes, but because uh, short is dominant over long, he's still going to be black and short. So once again, uh, as you interpret your Punnett square, you might pause so that you can determine the phenotypes of all of the individuals in this cross um, and come see if you can figure out the phenotypic ratio. Otherwise, you know, continue to watch. So we'll continue um, to, to interpret each one of the boxes. Notice that we've got some black and the longs coming up because they're only they have black genes. Um, but then they have the long genes as well, and long is recessive. And as long as you're homozygous recessive, you're going to show that phenotype. Uh, here's our first brown guy, brown and short. There's another brown and short. And then lastly but not leastly, we have our brown and long. So when we figure out uh, how many of each that we have, we're going to have nine which are going to be black and short. We're going to have three, which are uh, black and long, three, which are brown and short, and one, which is brown and long. So we still have that nine to three to three to one ratio that Mendel discovered when working with his pea plants. Now, this nine to three to three to one ratio only occurs um, under certain conditions. So you don't want to assume that every dihybrid cross is going to end up this way. 
The only way that you'll get this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio is, number one, both parents are heterozygous for both traits. So you remember that our, um, our guinea pigs were heterozygous for both traits, and both parents were heterozygous for both traits. If the parents, any one of the parents are not heterozygous for both traits, then all bets are off. You know, you want to make sure that you do the Punnett square to figure out the ratio. Another thing, um, which we'll be talking about soon, is in order for us to get that ratio, the genes for the traits have to be on separate chromosomes. They have to be carried on separate chromosomes so that they can be inherited independently of each other. And that's going to come soon. Lastly, but not leastly, we have to have true dominance in effect. One allele has to be able to dominate over the other. Otherwise, once again, all bets are off. We're not going to have this, this nice 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. In my opinion, um, no matter what kind of um, Punnett square that we're coming into, if you're a novice, um, I would go ahead and make sure that I assume nothing and go ahead and set up my Punnett square. I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you next time on Bio Lessons to Go.